conversation uh, for about 30 minutes after the event as well. So without further ado, I want to give uh, Toma the, the mic for uh, a few minutes just to kind of give some information about uh, Blue Ridge Labs. So, yeah. So I have the privilege of introducing Blue Ridge Labs, which is the office we're in right now. Uh, I was a fellow of Blue Ridge Labs two years ago. This office runs two programs. It runs a fellowship and an accelerator. And its goal is to build legal technology products that serve modest means New Yorkers. And it shows that goal because something unique about technology. You can, with a very small group of people, leverage technology to reach very many people. And technology is easy to prototype with. This office is affectionately called the uh, R&D department of the Robin Hood Foundation, which is a big poverty-fighting nonprofit in New York City. Uh, the Robin Hood Foundation's typical process is to identify existing companies that are doing good work, fund them so they can do more good work. The mission of this office is to create new companies, so it's a long shot. Excuse me. Um, the fellowship is an interesting program. A lot of the companies you're going to hear from came out of the fellowship. It takes individuals who've never met each other and over the course of six months coaches them on how to start a company, um, how to identify a need, how to build a prototype, and then how to seek funding. The follow-on program known as Catalyst, is that source of funding. So you go to the fellowship, you graduate, you get into Catalyst, and if you're lucky, you can stick around this office for two years like we have. So I'm going to introduce Jonathan, who is one of the Catalyst graduates uh, with Upsol. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So, um, right. and one other thing for any of the groups presenting, we are uh, filming this. Jolie back there is our amazing videographer, and uh, he's helping uh, film this event. So if anyone I know I'm actually filming it, but I'm streaming it. It's streaming it, sorry, sorry. Uh, and uh, I know Paladin, we're, we'll turn it off for you guys, but if anyone else uh, needs us to pause that, let us know before you start your presentations. Cool. Um, so I'm Jonathan Petz, I'm the co founder of Upsol, and we are a tech nonprofit that automates personal bankruptcy for low income folks who are buried in debt and need a fresh start, but they can't afford a bankruptcy lawyer. So, this is one of our first users, Linda, who was a single mom in Crown Heights, and she had a job, she was doing great, uh, until she got in a car accident. Then she broke her leg, she lost her job, all of a sudden she was a single mom making $25,000 a year who had, was $40,000 in medical debt. So for folks like Linda, there's supposed to be a lifeline. So our, our constitution created bankruptcy, right? And, and chapter seven bankruptcy uh, is, you know, other countries um, in Europe, for example, will have this social safety net for people who lose their job or get injured. Uh, for us, that, that safety net is bankruptcy. So. Uh, the big three causes of 90% of bankruptcy cases uh, are not people who are just irresponsible with credit, it's people who get injured, people who lose their jobs, and people who get divorced. And for those folks, Chapter 7 erases that debt, uh, and that's not all it does. It also um, improves access to credit, uh, because people's credit utilization rates improve dramatically uh, when they go from owning, owing $40,000 in debt to $0 in debt. Um, it also improves access to banking uh, and makes you 12% more likely to be employed, according to recent research. So the problem is that uh, this lifeline is broken. It costs $2,000 uh, 
to hire a bankruptcy lawyer because it's a very form-driven process that uh, just requires a lot of document collection and data entry. And, um, and as a result, we hear all the time uh, from users that if I had $2,000 to hire a lawyer, I wouldn't need to file for bankruptcy. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve here at Upsolve uh, by using technology to, to automate this process. And what we've built, oh, sorry, this is a, this is a big uh, number. Uh, apparently, according to a leading economist, 20 million households would benefit from a fresh start in uh, America, and last year, under half a million filed. And that's a number that's been decreasing every year for the last 10 years as the cost of filing for bankruptcy and attorney's fees has increased. So, so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. So the way this works is that users will come to our website and they'll get screened for having a very simple uh, no asset chapter seven case, which is probably about 90% of, of chapter seven cases. So these are people who have over $10,000 in debt, uh, under the median income, don't own real estate, uh, and a couple of other smaller criteria. So if you pass that screening tool, then um, you will enter into the website everything that you make, spend, own, and own. And our tool will automate the creation of the bankruptcy forms uh, that get filed with the court. And this is basically 70 pages of documents. It's, it's like taxes on steroids. And we use cartoons and videos to, to extract the information that we need to populate these forms. Um, we have internal uh, error checking tools. And so far, we, we helped Linda get a fresh start. Um, last year, she erased her $40,000 in debt and she went on to get a better job and is doing great things. We also, uh, we launched in January in 14 states and um, so, so we're expanding, um, helping folks uh, across the country. And the way that we've raised $5 million in the last three months, and sort of the big question for us is we have this really uh, powerful product that helps people very efficiently, um, but uh, finding people to help is our challenge. So. As you can imagine, there's all kinds of scams that low-income people face um, you know, on a daily basis online for, for things that are supposedly free but, but aren't. Uh, so we are finding folks, or this is, this is our approach to scale. Uh, we're getting on bankruptcy court websites, basic, which are basically advertising for us, so we can find folks that way. We are building uh, partnerships with uh, fintech companies like Credit Karma and Lending Tree, which have millions of users in financial distress. Um, and also there are free tax prep sites um, across the city and, and across the country that help four million low income folks, many of whom uh, have significant debt problems. So we are a nonprofit, but we also have an earned revenue component. So we sell our software to uh, legal aid organizations that brick and mortar legal aid organizations across the country that help low income folks um, and this allows them to multiply the number of folks that they're able to serve. Uh, we're supported by some awesome foundations uh, the Robin Hood Foundation, uh, Eric Schmidt, former uh, CEO of Google's foundation, Mark Zuckerberg's foundation, uh, public Welfare, Harvard, um, and uh, some, some awesome law firms as well. And the team behind this, we have, we have a, um, we've been lucky to work with some awesome people on this. So my background was I used to be a corporate bankruptcy lawyer at, at large firms in New York, and I did this work pro bono, these, these Chapter 7 cases, and I was just amazed by how inefficient this, this problem is. And, and, it's no mystery that there are millions of folks who are literally too broke to get a fresh start. So, so that was my motivation for starting this. My co-founder Rohan um, has done a lot of work 
at uh, Harvard Law School's Access to Justice Lab. And uh, then our chief engineer, Mark, who's back there, um, is the, the <laughs> <laughs> Mark is the technical uh, genius that, that makes this all run. And lastly, Kristen, who's our head of partnerships, recently graduated from uh, Harvard Law School, where she was the president of the Black Law Student Association and turned down jobs from White and Case, Wilson Sonsini, Boston Consulting Group, and Bain Capital to work for us. So that's like my mic drop moment. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're like incredibly flattered slash shocked that, that she's on our team. Uh, and also we have, this is, part of what we're doing is sort of controversial from a regulatory perspective. And so what's really helpful is we've got a bunch of bankruptcy judges and um, well-known law professors on our advisory board, which gives us a lot of credibility to go out and start messing things up. Uh, so we've gotten some nice media coverage and, and gotten good at, at sharing our narrative with the world. And uh, we're excited to, um, help a lot of folks get, get a fresh start around the country. And that's all I got, so I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Yeah? It's true, you can't discharge student loan debt. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, so um, what's the sort of fee structure? How does that work? Are you, are you charging only sort of uh, your, your partners that would then, you know, provide an act of for free to their clients? or? Yeah, we, we, we don't charge clients. Uh, we, do, we charge these legal aid organizations um, $5,000 a year. Uh, but there is this tension between like, helping as many people as possible and also getting earned revenue. So we're, we're still sort of figuring out that balance. Yeah, Linda. Do you do any kind of triage with the, the type of student loans? Because there are some private student loans that are dischargeable with Right. We don't, basically we tell people, we don't, um, and we tell people if you have student loan debts that you want to discharge, we're not the right platform for that. You, you basically need a lawyer to, to do that, yeah. Yes? So do you uh, continuously improve your product, or is it? Yes, it is definitely. Uh, <laughs> I mean, actually, I, that's funny because I, I, in my former life, as you know, I was a lawyer, um, and uh, and so I kind of had this vision that oh, once you know, we'll just build it and then we'll be done. We'll just be distributing it and marketing it. But no, unfortunately, it's never done. So is, is there a website that anybody can go on? And find yeah, it's at upsolve.org. You guys can can pull it up right now. Desktop and mobile, right? Art. Yeah. Are you, so, so is, is it all self-contained in the website or? Do you it need, is, yeah. So the website does everything, you don't yeah. need any hand-holding with any staff or anything? Well, we have, we answer people's questions by chat bot, um, also sometimes over the phone if there's, uh, and there's also sort of an error checking component that most of which is automated, but uh, we also have sort of paralegals um, who do that so as well. So it's not, it's not like a zero. It's not, no, you're right, it's not. Yes. So does the end user start the process here or do you need the legal aid organization as the advocate to help them through the process? How does that work? Well, the, the legal aid, it's self-contained. So the, the legal aid organization is just, their job is to refer people to us oh, if, right. if that's how, okay. how somebody finds us. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Good calls up next. Yeah, I'm Jeff Hall. I'm the Chief Legal Officer at
I don't know, that's just right. Okay. Oh, he's he sounding bad. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulty there. Um, so my name is Gabe, um, I'm a co-founder of Good Call. Um, we run a free 24 seven hotline uh, that allows immediate access to a lawyer in case of arrest. Um, we also came out of the Blue Ridge Labs Fellowship here um, that Tomo was talking about earlier. Um, and my co-founders and I, we really wanted to look into the way that the criminal justice system and the police um, impact uh, low income communities around the city here. And so to figure out uh, if there was any way that technology might be able to make that um, uh, very uh, oppressive and tenuous relationship any less so, um, we went out into the city and just talked to dozens and dozens of folks um, about their experiences dealing with the police. And we kept hearing uh, about this process where people would be arrested for waiting for the bus or drinking a beer in front of their apartment or hopping a turnstile, right? Sometimes something really trivial, sometimes literally doing nothing wrong at all. Um, and what would happen is they would be put in the back of a police car, taken to a precinct, and all of their belongings would be taken away, including their cell phone. And so the only way they could reach out for help is by call, like when they get their one phone call, uh, dialing a number that they had memorized ahead of time. Um, and so as you guys can imagine, most people just try to call their moms because it's the only number they have memorized. Most of the time they don't pick up and no one was able to get in touch with the person they needed most in that moment, a lawyer. So what this means is they're not able to access the help that they need and they don't meet their public defender until just minutes before going in front of a judge. So the person going through this process, they see the public defender sitting there in the courtroom, they see them talking to the judge. A lot of times it seems like everyone's colluding against them. And for the public defender, even if they're a really incredible lawyer that's dedicated to their job, they only have a few minutes to get to know each client because they've just gotten 20 cases popped on their desk at the same time. And so it's a lose-lose for everyone. And the consequences of this lack of support um, are varied and devastating, right? People oftentimes uh, talk to the police, try to talk themselves out of the situation and end up saying things that uh, are incriminating. Um, they can be sent to pretrial jail, lose their jobs because they no call, no show the next day. Um, every case is different, but the outcomes are often really bad. One of the young men we spoke to, uh, his name was Ray, he was arrested for fitting the description of a suspect and ended up sitting on Rikers Island for two weeks before they figured out they had the wrong guy, at which point he had lost his job. And one of the quotes we got from him was, I knew I didn't do anything, but I didn't know who to call, right? Um, every day, 125 people are sent to uh, pretrial jail in New York City because they can't pay bail and the average wait time for a trial is 50 days. So you can imagine how detrimental this is to someone's life. And uh, because I'm talking to a bunch of lawyers, I wanted to pull this in. From a systemic standpoint, it's not just that, um, that it's this broken, inefficient process, but it's actually denying people this core right promised by the Constitution, right? We're supposed to have representation under the Sixth Amendment um, to, for a fair trial, but the problem is the way the system works today. People aren't able to access that representation soon enough in the process, which makes the whole thing biased against them. And so our vision with Good Call was to provide that immediate access to a lawyer so that people can have a fair process and a just outcome. Um, and we do this in two ways. Our primary service is a free 24 seven hotline that anyone can call in case of an arrest and get connected with a free lawyer right away at one of our partner legal organizations. 
We also added a uh, kind of additional benefit that's optional uh, based on the fact that, once again, people don't memorize uh, phone numbers in this day and age. And it can be really helpful to get in touch with a loved one or an employer or a program that someone is in so that they can validate community ties, provide additional information, pay bail, um, and help make that person's case so that a judge will release them as opposed to holding them in pretrial detention. And so we added this option for folks to save emergency contact information in a directory um, so they could make sure they could reach their loved ones in case of an arrest. So what this process looks like with good call, if someone is arrested or if a loved one is arrested, um, instead of having to memorize that number, they can simply call 8333 good call. And the software that we've built will automatically connect their call to the right attorney at the right legal provider based on the time of day, their area of expertise, what borough they were arrested in, what language they speak, to make sure that they can talk to a lawyer in under a minute. That lawyer can tell them not to talk to the police, they can invoke their rights, start doing early research, and basically have an extra two days to prepare that person's case, which can make a huge difference. Um, we also built a, uh, a tool for the attorneys who staff the hotline so they can easily search through our emergency contact directory. If that person has any contact saved in there, um, they can just type in their name and with the click of a button, uh, send them a text message prompting them to get in touch with that attorney so they can work together on the arrested person's behalf. And this support actually enables better legal representation um, and fairer outcomes and makes the public defenders job a little bit easier because they can get ahead of some of those statements that oftentimes are really damaging and happen in those first 24 to 48 hours after an arrest. So we uh, launched a pilot of uh, this idea back in 2016, partnering with the Bronx Defenders. Um, and after a few months, we uh, brought Legal Aid Society on board also. So now we have attorneys from those two organizations um, fielding calls. And over the past 20 months, we've uh, connected over 600 people to legal help with over 90% caller satisfaction and an average hold time of under one minute. Um, and over 350 people have saved emergency contacts. Um, because we were dealing with such a high stakes uh, situation, we needed to make sure to start small, make sure that we could provide a really high quality of service, um, and make sure that we could show that this was something that was really valuable to the community um, and to public defenders. Um, to give one example, uh, this young man on the left, his name is Jameek. Um, he is a 17 year old kid who lives in the Bronx um, and lives with his mom who's a home health aide. And the police showed up at their door early one morning and said that he was a suspect in a backpack robbery case um, and that they needed to take him in. So his mom followed him to the precinct um, and when she got there asked where her son was and they said they had no idea. So she had to go to work. She was freaking out because she didn't know where to turn for, to help or what they were going to do with her son. But luckily she got Good Call's number uh, through some of our community outreach. She was able to call, get a Bronx Defenders attorney on the phone in under a minute. He located her son, went down to the precinct, and witnessed the police putting him in a biased lineup where they basically showed a victim her son and said, this is the kid we think did it, and then showed them the full lineup and said, who do you think did it? Obviously, they picked out her son, and unfortunately, this happens all the time. But luckily, since there was an attorney there to witness that, he was able to bring this up in court. The judge threw out that lineup, and he was able to return that very next night instead of uh, being on a bus to Rikers Island. Um, and we still actually, uh, my colleague is friends with him on Facebook, and he's going to college now and playing basketball. Whereas otherwise, that one arrest for something that he didn't do could have messed up his whole entire life. Um, another really important component of the work that we do um, is working with the communities that we serve. Um, there is rightfully so a lot of distrust in this system um, and organizations working in it. And so we make sure to uh, partner with local organizations that are already working um, with system impacted youth and families um, to get the word out. And we also, uh, when we can, employ um, system impacted youth in the communities that we're serving to act as credible messengers and spread awareness about the service that we're providing. Um, which brings us to today. So uh, based on um, the success that we've seen and the impact we've shown that we can have over the past two years, we're actually launching from the Bronx to all five boroughs of New York City in two weeks. <laughs> so um, thank you. Um, uh, it's a really exciting milestone for us. Um, uh, we also uh, have relied on help from so many other organizations like our public defender partners, um, like the uh, 
community-based organizations who help us raise awareness. Um, and so also wanted to just take this opportunity to say um, if any folks in this room are interested in getting more involved, um, we can always use pro bono legal help. We're trying to do a more rigorous evaluation of the impact that we're having um, and looking for help kind of framing that experiment um, and can use help on a whole bunch of other things too. So please come find me after if you're interested in learning more and getting involved. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. So as of now, all of the attorneys staffing the hotline are staff attorneys at those organizations. Um, but we are looking um, for the future, and particularly when we expand into cities that have less resources than those offices, um, a sort of network where volunteer attorneys can be the ones staffing the phones and then passing that information to the public defenders. Um, so that's a model that we're really excited about exploring. And then does the, does the attorney who takes that call they end up taking that case, or are they Yeah, so it's up to the organization to figure out how to staff it. Yeah, usually it's a separate, they, they'll have one uh, department that's staffing the line and then passing that information to the team of attorneys who actually staff arraignment. So it'll be the same organization, but not the same person necessarily. Yeah? Other question? Uh, do you have an estimate what percentage of people who might need that kind of line would need to get, you know, start using it for the resources to be overwhelmed, uh, exhausted in New York City? Do you have an estimate? Um, so our hope is that as we, is that we can balance the like supply and demand for lack of a better word, right? Um, the more calls we get, the more impact we can prove and the better we can advocate for funding from other foundations and for, from the city government who already funds most of these public defenders, um, to provide them more support. But as things are now, how, how, what percentage can you actually serve? Um, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it, like maybe 10% of arrestees um, as a very finger in the wind estimate. Um, but uh, we've also uh, been speaking with like city council members and are, are about potentially mandating uh, our number being provided at each precinct, for example. Um, and so the kind of dream future state is that every single person in New York City who gets arrested gets the good call number and that our legal partners have adequate funding from the city to staff the hotline for all those people. And you have a jingle so they remember the number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, time for one more, one more question. Um, yeah. Um, so are you looking far enough out that, I, I mean, how easy would this be to implement in other cities across the United States once the model is created and yeah, um, so uh, we have already started looking at national expansion because our goal is to operate across the country yeah. and not surprisingly different districts uh, are very different, right, in terms of their resources, their processes. Um, we've uh, been um, farthest along in conversations with like New Orleans and Oakland and Minneapolis and places where, um, focusing on places where the problem is really big but their public defender office is also really forward thinking and wants to try out new things to better serve their clients. Um, so folks like prioritizing those places first. Um, like I said, we want to be everywhere but there are like particularly looking at the kind of landscape of like the deep south where the problem is often the worst. Also, their public defender offices are like so strapped that we need to get more creative with how we make that possible. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
All right. Uh, is this is the stream back on? Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. Hi, I'm Michael, uh, co-founder and uh, software developer at Community Lawyer. Um, just going to take a few minutes to talk about what we're doing. Would love to hear your feedback and questions afterwards. Um, so uh, we came out of we're a public benefit company founded in 2016. We came out of the Blue Ridge Labs fellowship program. Um, the topic that year was improving access to civil justice in the U in New York City. Um, and uh, we had five months to research and prototype a product that would improve access to civil justice. Uh, this picture right here is of uh, me and my co-founder Scott doing some user research over at the Court Square Law Project at CUNY. Um, and during our time we found that, uh, we learned that um, local bar association lawyer referral services play a crucial role, uh, especially for uh, low and modest income populations in the city. That. Um, uh, are facing an urgent legal need and maybe low information consumers and uh, it's really hard to find a good lawyer online. There's a lot of scammy, unsavory folks. Um, so the bar associations offer a service where they vet uh, their members and they offer a like a phone number or a website where you can find lawyers online or on the phone. Um, but we found that the, ex the user experience is often poor for each of clients, lawyers, and staff uh, because a lot of the time the tech is just way behind. Um, most of the bar association referral services don't have websites, or if they do, they don't work on phones. Um, and there's a lot of administrative staff work that's easy to automate with custom software. So, um, uh, yeah, so we started by, we thought, oh, our best chance at improving uh, access to justice is to make these law referral services work really well. So we built, uh, we designed and developed a, uh, a, a web application that is, you know, finely tuned to power and LRS. Uh, it lets it provides a really nice, modern-looking, you know, mobile-friendly intake system for a client uh, to match with a lawyer online. Um, it automates a lot of the work that administrative staff has to do to like remind lawyers to report on their matters and pay their fees and um, and all that. Um, and uh, I'm proud to say that we've partnered with 17 and counting uh, lawyer referral networks across the country, um, including two statewide bar associations and some pretty big metros. Um, we ran the numbers on this last week and this represents something like five to 10 percent of all LRS traffic in the US. Um, but uh, from the beginning, our goal has always been to like increase the uh, affordability and accessibility of uh, civil legal help by an order of magnitude, not just at the margin. And so that's what has brought us to um, Act Two, um, which is Doc Assemble. So Doc Assemble is a um, software product that's been, uh, it's an open, free and open source uh, software tool uh, built by a man named Jonathan Pyle of Philadelphia Legal Assistance, um, which uh, is a tool that with a little bit of programming can help you very rapidly develop uh, a guided interview and document assembly tool. So a um, little bit of code and it outputs in this, like, this interview um, that can assemble a document at the end. Um, so, uh, you know, document assembly and expert systems in general are not a new idea. Um, this is the first page of Google uh, search results for the phrase robot lawyer in quotes. Um, most of the results are about do not pay, which is the traffic ticket thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you have some fatalistic headlines about, you know, like, the robot lawyers are here and they're winning. Um, whereas, we, you know, we think that Wikipedia's definition is more, like, on track. Um, Wikipedia says that a, a robot lawyer is uh, an application that can perform tasks that are typically done by paralegals or young associates of law firms. So we don't really think that, ro like, robots are going to replace human lawyers anytime soon. But we do think that new tech um, and new applications can really drastically cut down on the amount of routine, non-specialized work that lawyers currently have to do which are driving up the cost of legal services. Um, so uh, in 2018, we, did, we began building infrastructure and tools to uh, improve the accessibility and usability of DocAssemble. Um, so specifically, we found that the amount of, or the level of technical sophistication that it takes to use the system to like build an interview is a lot higher, is a lot lower than that requirement required to install the software. Just installing this thing is really hard. So we built uh, like a button that you click and it installs it automatically. Um, we also developed a system that lets you save answers from those interviews because that's not a native function of the software. So 
when people take, like answer your interview, you can see what they said. Um, and we also provide a service that allows uh, people to sign up to indicate that they're interested in getting uh, leads for work uh, 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 for legal applications that we source from our growing network of bar associations. So if a lawyer or a, a network has an idea for a tool that could be built to automate some legal function, um, we want to connect uh, developers that are proficient with using this tool doc symbol uh, to those opportunities. Now the next thing that we're thinking of building or th that we're making available is what we're calling the referral API. And we want to we want to use this to bridge uh, Doc Assemble with the network of referral services we've built. And the way it works, or the way that we envision it working is that it provides programmatic access to uh, uh, to legal referrals. So you can imagine that, for example, you build a an intake app with Doc Assemble that diagnoses someone for a legal issue. And if their answer is indicated they could benefit from a referral to a lawyer, then we will automatically forward the user's information to one of the, net, the, the participating networks in our, uh, in our group of legal networks. So for example, like, um, uh, uh, you know, you could like build an app that it identifies someone who could use a bankruptcy lawyer. And you could forward that information to uh, a bankruptcy lawyer in, uh, depending on like where the user indicates that they live, how much income they have. Um, another thing that we think might be possible is that uh, if we have experts that are building uh, interviews that are so sophisticated they generate leads, um, that are so qualified, um, that lawyer referral services might be willing to pay for those leads. Um, so that um, it, like, it would provide an incentive for um, experts to productize or to share their knowledge. Uh, because referral services get a cut of the referral fees, or of the client fees that attorneys collect. So if, if an intake app is able to produce a referral that's so qualified that it's all but guaranteed to result in engagement, we're betting that a lawyer referral service is willing to pay the author for that lead. Um, so this is, I mean, one thing that we're interested in, that we think is an interesting evolution of, um, or an application of, of what document assembly software can do. Um, yeah, so that's what we are, that's what we're doing. Happy to take questions. Thanks for listening. Uh, is, is doc assembly mostly for intake or for like legal documents, creation of legal documents? So it's a pretty flexible system. Um, basically what it does is it lets you define questions uh, and uh, the system will automatically identify what information each question depends on. So the, the really nice thing about it is that you don't have to worry about ordering your questions. It'll figure out what order to ask the questions in based on the information that the questions depend on. Um, so you can use it for anything. The developer is a lawyer and built it with legal applications in mind. So that, um, but you know, yeah, so it, it does both. It does both the intake side and the document assembly side. Um, is, does that answer your question? Yeah, but yeah. it's not, you have to have the legal referral service to use it. It's not, um, it's not, there's not a website where you just go and try. Well, so it's, it's, like, it's like a framework, it's like a tool. So you can install it and then learn the, you have to know how to program a little bit, but it's, you don't have to be an expert, it's just a little bit of programming. And that tool lets you build those interviews. What we want to do is integrate it with the network referral services that we've put together so that you know, the best case for us is, oh, not only does a user get whatever documents they need to start, uh, you know, to file for bankruptcy or to file for divorce or to start a business or to file for immigration or whatever it is, not only do you get those documents, but you also get a referral to a lawyer. So we're solving two of your problems, if that makes sense. So I have just found out that was like, so who, uh, if the referral comes after they interact with the system, who is it that's creating the questionnaire or the interview? Since they will, maybe I misunderstood, but it sounds like somebody sets it up in the first instance. Yeah, yeah, so who someone, so, uh, anyone who is either uh, expert enough in an area of the law to, to develop such an interview, um, or like a, a developer or a contractor that that lawyer might hire. Is there, are there, are there a professional responsibility or practice law questions that come with providing that level of kind of algorithmic advice, that, that developing that questionnaire? How do, how do like bar associations evaluate this sort of tool? 
Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. Um, uh, it probably depends on, on what exactly the tool is doing. I mean, I know there's a level of like, oh, at what point does the interview become like unauthorized practice of law? But if it just is identifying, like if you, I, if you indicate that, oh, you know, um, I need a divorce or something, and then if the last step of the interview is, oh, click this button to get a referral to a divorce lawyer, if it's not giving you legal advice, then as far as I know, it's not, it doesn't run into any kind of like of those questions. Hi, I'm Linda Taverdi. I am the co-founder of the nonprofit Daisy Debt. My co-founder is Devin Hearth. Like, uh, I think four out of the five of us, uh, I, my um, uh, Daisy Debt grew out of it the summer program of 2016. Um, my background is, I'm not a tech person. I'm a recovering lawyer. I came directly to the Blue Ridge Labs uh, fellowship from legal academia, uh, but I have to say I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, so, since I'm a lawyer and there are a lot of legal professionals in the room, I want to start with a hypothetical, and I hope that doesn't bring back too much trauma for anybody. Uh, so here's my hypothetical. Uh, where's Scott? I told him I was going to do this to him, but he's not here. Oh, okay. So I borrow a hundred dollars, or uh, let's see, wait, you borrow a hundred dollars from me. Scott borrows a hundred dollars from me. He pays back five dollars, and then he stops paying. Doesn't matter why. So I try to collect from him for a little for a little while, and I just can't um, can't get him to pay. Now I could I could just let it go. I could sue him, or I could sell this debt that I have with that Scott has with me to someone else. So here is my for your consideration. This is the debt. So I ask now. Here's the hypothetical. I'm selling this as is. Is this a debt? Would you buy it? For how much? And how would you collect on it? So, if you um, if you if you bought this debt uh, and and I sold it to you, and this is what I gave you, and you knocked on Scott's door and said I bought this debt, and you might even say I bought this debt from Linda. You need to pay me now. Would you have questions for? for the person that showed up at your door looking for collection, looking for payment? Yes. Probably, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. So this hypothetical is the debt collection industry in a nutshell. This is, you can't see this very well, but this is an offering that I pulled just today from a website that sells portfolios of debt. This is what you buy when you buy a portfolio of debt. So you get, um, th this listing shows the, uh, a few different things. The age of the debt, which right here, you can't really see it so well, but it's 2013, which means we're pushing up against statute of limitations. Um, it tells you the number of accounts that there are, about 2,500 in this portfolio, um, average balance of about $400 uh, for a total of over a million dollars. That's one portfolio. <coughs> Now, you don't get to see this portfolio. I mean, it's 2,500 lines of debt, so that's a lot. You get a peek at it, it just to get a flavor for what the debt looks like. But that's it. That's what you're buying. So the question that I have here is, is this still a debt? Is, is this, are we still calling this debt? Is this something that you could take to court and enforce? Um, so if you are buying this, if you're buying debt 
through these kinds of portfolios, what are your options for collecting? This is one of them. Mm -hmm. You can harass, intimidate, manipulate. You can, do, you can just like make a lot of phone calls, even if they're not technically harassment or manipulation. But you can, you can push really hard on a personal level. The other thing that you can do is you can go to court. But if you don't have, if what you have is the, just like a, a, that, that level of documentation that we saw, uh, you can't prove that you have bought anything based on that level of documentation, and that is typical. So what you do is you take advantage of our adversary system, which allows you to put in a, a complaint, and uh, it, the adversary system <laughs> depends on someone showing up to uh, uh, to ask for proof and to question the proof and to test it. Uh, most of the time, 95% of the time, a consumer, if they show up, will show up without a, a lawyer. And a great deal of the time, consumers don't show up at all because they didn't get properly served, because they didn't understand what they got served with, so they don't show up. The no-shows the no result in a default judgment that is now very powerful. It is not, that is really hard to defeat. And they last for 20 years and can be renewed for another 20. So the statute of limitations is out of the question at that point. The other thing is even if a consumer shows up and they negotiate a settlement, what kind of settlement are they gonna negotiate for themselves when they don't even know that they have rights? Uh, those settlements get converted into judgments as well. So, <clears throat> This is also not a small problem. Oh, already. Uh, it's not a small problem. Um, th these are some of the stats on debt collection. It's really become a, a, a common part of our lives. And then um, Jonathan talked about why people fall into debt. It isn't because they just, um, it isn't because they just like squandered their money and, and made bad decisions. Sometimes they make bad decisions, but most of the time it's losing a job or divorce or some other kind of thing. So I was gonna, I don't, I'm already at five minutes, wow. So I was going to show you a demonstration of how what we do, what Daisy Debt does, is it, 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 it um, uses existing consumer laws that provide rights to protect consumers against harassment, to uh, require proof that the debt is real, that some documentation that it exists and that the person claiming actually owns it, and also protects exempt income so that people aren't paying their rent money over to a debt collector who can actually afford to stand in line and wait until the consumer's in a better place. We, um, those, those rights exist, but you have to ask for them, and as a practical matter, you have to ask for them in writing. We automate the process of asking for those rights. We work with financial coaches. I, I'm not gonna do the demonstration because I don't have time, but I can. Oh, all right. Okay. So, actually, this is um, this is our dashboard that shows you uh, shows a financial. We work with financial coaches, and I can explain why we made that very uh, intentional decision. Um, we the dashboard allows a financial coach to see all of the letters that they have written. Um, we are the debt collection agency. I'll tell you how fact this is. The fact. Uh, so you just put in a little bit of personal information. Uh, you um, okay? Let's see. It asks you about your exempt income because uh, letting the debt collector know that, the, that you have only exempt income discourages them from pursuing you because they can't collect against it. So let's say disability, because, uh, and then, oh goodness, sorry. <laughs> this is, I don't, I can't get to the bottom, oh there we go. Uh, sure, why not? Um, and then, um, we are collecting some information about how much debt we are able to um, do that. Um, and then you, you can uh, customize the letter based on, let's say, we're, we don't know who's asking. I don't know who this is. Um, no, and we have a letter that you can review, and you can send it directly from our application. 
Once you've sent the letter, you will get uh, the, both the consumer and the financial coach will get tracking information. We automate uh, follow-up emails to, to help um, encourage the mutual responsibility between financial coaches and the consumers, and we provide legal information and support to the financial cons uh, the, co the coaches and counselors so that it, it expands their capacity to be able to deal with these debt collection problems up to the point where they become where they actually require legal advice and assistance. Um, so that's date and debt. We're working this, uh, this, this, for the next couple of months, we're uh, entrepreneurs and residents with the AARP Foundation. We are working with them to uh, measure our impact. Um, we reduce debt, improve credit scores, and we uh, argue, at least, that we encourage uh, retention into the coaching process. Um, and um, we are, oh, yes, this is really important. We're also trying to design a version of this product that we can offer direct to consumers um, that is going to take careful thought uh, on the design side and also on the legal side. And uh, we're working with the AARP to figure that out. Um. who actually don't even, there is no debt. Yeah. They did just, I, I, I've, I've had friends and acquaintances or their relations, um, you know, they pay the debt and then they get called eight more times mm -hmm. with threats that, you know, we're going to come and arrest you and all these other things. Sure. I mean, is, and obviously that's a bit collateral to hear, but if No, it's actually is, not. Oh, okay. <laughs> because, I, I mean, I was right. rushing through this, but this is a, a bit of a work in progress with okay. this pitch, but um, one, the, the laws also say that once you, I mean, if it's a complete scam, they're not yeah. going to worry yeah. about it. But if you, but once you send this letter, the debt collection agency has to provide you with documentation and answer some of your questions about who are you right. and what are you collecting. Right. If they don't, they have to stop collecting. If they don't stop collecting, it is a violation of federal law. Right. Federal law carries with it some pretty stiff automatic so penalties. is there a part of this that then reports that and um, uses that opportunity? Because, I mean, mm -hmm. right now there's essentially no consequences for people right. who do that. Even right. Even though there are laws against it. Yes, that is that is on our drawing board. Right, one yeah, of the no, no, so no, no, what it, it, yeah one of the interesting things about this was that we we initially started this at thinking this was going to be a tool for lawyers, but what we've learned um, is that until there's a lawsuit or until there is just an egregious violation, yeah. there's no pain point to address yeah. with lawyers. Yeah. Uh, we address a pain point with financial coaches who need to write these letters right. quickly, efficiently, and be able to follow up on them yeah. and remember, like, you know, figure out, like, uh, resolve the debt issue. Um, uh, a lot of the time, uh, uh, at least 50% of the time, and we're looking at more like 75% of the time, the debt just goes away because, because it's not documentable right. and um, sometimes a scam. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think that's all the time we have okay. for questions here, but obviously we have the space for the next 30, 40 minutes, so grab a drink, uh, talk, you guys can stay around, but thanks again. To the